one, two. Okay, so it's just two. Good. Let's see. Now we begin the last session of the conference with Nima Arkaniamed, who will talk about. Uh, by the way, Nima, what are you talking about? Oh. <laughs> You'll find out, won't you? <laughs> yeah, please. Aha, uh -huh, thank you. Ah, uh, that's much better. Yeah. Yeah, we'll All right, excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> so it's, uh, it's both a great pleasure and a great honor to uh, speak at this celebration of Ricardo's uh, career today. Uh, unlike many of you, I think, um, I have not had the privilege of uh, collaborating uh, with uh, Ricardo. Uh, but he has been one of um, a very, very small group of truly great great with a capital G uh, theoretical physicists that I've known. Uh, and his ideas have had a deep and, and profound impact, um, obviously not just on my career, uh, but indeed on the entire field of uh, physics beyond the standard model. Um, I think it's fair to say that, that uh, very, very few people uh, have thought as deeply uh, about the most central problems of the field, uh, always with an eye of uh, making some contact between fundamental theoretical ideas and experiment, uh, as uh, Ricardo has. Uh, I think I first met Ricardo around 18 years ago um, as uh, uh, Lawrence's uh, grad student. Uh, occasionally, I, I would discover that Lawrence would disappear in his office. Uh, and behind closed doors, something interesting was going on that I wasn't privy to. Uh, and it was always associated with this uh, mysterious and, and intense uh, Italian uh, physicist who would uh, come by. Um, and uh, I asked some of my older fellow grad students about him, and they said, that's Ricardo Barbieri. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, and they always said it in that kind of voice. Um, and uh, I asked what this Ricardo Barbieri was like, and, and you know, everyone said that he was quite, quite nice, uh, <laughs> but that he was very intimidating. Um, and I very well still remember, I'm sure Ricardo doesn't remember any of this, uh, but I remember the first physics conversation I had with him. Um, at the time, uh, Lawrence and Cynthia Chang and I were working on something I found extremely exciting then. Actually, I still find really cool now. No one cares about it. Um, but there are some uh, really interesting theories of radiative fermion masses. Um, and these were sort of really interesting theories of flavor. You had to think there was a supersymmetry played a critical role in how these ideas worked. They had this ancient history going back to Weinberg. Uh, there was all sorts of wonderful things involved in them. Um, <clears throat> uh, they're also very difficult to make realistic. Uh, almost all such theories were excluded by flavor changing neutral currents. Um, you have to have large flavor violations, uh, obviously, to, uh, to break the relevant chiral symmetries. The idea is that you had these large flavor violations in the soft masses, and when you integrate out the superpartners, you would generate the, uh, the fermion masses. Uh, but even though they were difficult to make work, they're really exciting to work on. You had to learn a lot of physics. It was a perfect, perfect uh, project for a beginning grad student. I was very um, excited about them, so Ricardo walked in uh, to our office, sat down, and asked what, what we were up to. And I was nervous at first, but uh, I started talking about the physics I was very excited about, and it all went away. Um, and Ricardo was uh, uh, not at all intimidating. He asked extremely penetrating, important questions. Um, but I remember distinctly feeling, uh, as he walked out, that he thought this, he didn't think this was as awesome as I did. <laughs> okay. 
Um, and uh, in fact, uh, I grew to resent Ricardo a little bit because shortly after that, um, uh, he stole my advisor's interest in this fantastic project, you see. Uh, Lawrence was excited about these ideas of radio fermion masses, and then it all disappeared, and he was off in the land of U2 flavor symmetries, okay? Um, no more thoughts about our awesome theories of radio fermion masses. And I, you know, I was pretty, I was slightly pissed off by this, right? <laughs> I mean, you too, big whoop. You know, you have a bunch of flavor. You have, you know, it's just all group theory. Where's the dynamics? Where's all the excitement? Uh, where's, the, where's the physics? It's just a bunch of group theory. Who gives a crap? Uh, and um, that feeling went on until the day I turned in my PhD thesis. Our theories of radiative fermion masses were decisively excluded by experiment. <laughs> okay? uh, the, the, they, they predicted a large rate for tau to, tau to E gamma. Uh, that was just killed, that was just killed by, by, by experiment. And I learned an important lesson, and this is, I think, a, a lesson I've, I've often learned from Ricardo. It's much more important to be right than to be clever. Uh, or in this case, uh, to at least not be wrong <laughs> than to be clever. And those are the standards that we have these days in our field. Just, just not being wrong is already uh, a, a, a tall feat. Um, and so, indeed, the, these, the, the U2 theories, uh, they didn't have as much uh, uh, exciting physics, but they're not wrong. In fact, they're, they came to be wrong, I think, around 10 years later. <laughs> but uh, but at, certainly at the time, they, they, uh, they weren't. Uh, so that was my first interaction with uh, uh, Ricardo. Um, uh, the next one uh, that I remember very well was actually right here um, around uh, uh, 2004, 2005, I think, at a workshop in uh, Pisa. And this was the second uh, uh, conference at which I gave a talk about split supersymmetry and the idea that there may be anthropic determination of the weak scale. Now, it's really, it's really nice these days that at least people can get up and say these things uh, without being screamed at. Back then, if you got up and said these things, you were screamed at, okay? And uh, the first talk uh, I gave on this subject was actually at Johns Hopkins, and I was yelled at, quite literally, I was yelled at by my uh, model building brethren who accused me of selling out, um, you know, all sorts of terrible things. If they had tomatoes, they would have thrown them. Um, uh, this didn't bother me so much because the people throwing the tomatoes, I didn't particularly care about their opinions so much. Uh, but I came here and um, I gave a talk on this subject with Ricardo sitting more or less roughly where he's sitting now relative to me, glaring at me the entire time, okay? <laughs> Uh, he, didn't have to, he didn't have to yell, he didn't have to uh, swear or scream. Uh, the glare and the disappointment in his expression was enough to devastate me. Okay? Um, and in fact, I very well remember um, that uh, you know, well, other people were yelling and screaming. I didn't care about them, but this, this quiet guy who was obviously, you let me down, you know, how could you do this? Right? <laughs> Um, that, that really hurt. And, and to just add to the hurt, uh, I, I remember very well, we went um, to this uh, fantastic restaurant where they served wild boar. Um, and as a vegetarian, I couldn't eat the wild boar. But I was sitting at a table with the, with the Ricardo, eating the wild boar. You know, you couldn't get more uh, masculine or you couldn't more emasculate me in comparison eating my little vegetables, trying to defend the anthropic <laughs> principle. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I remember that very, very well. But I also remember, as, as obviously, you know, as unhappy as he was with, with, uh, with the direction that, that at least my own research was going in at the time, uh, it was all about physics. And, and, um, and, uh, 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 and I have nothing but uh, extremely fond memories of even that uh, interaction. And of course, um, uh, all of these issues revolve around uh, this uh, strange, frustrating notion of naturalness, uh, which has been with us for, uh, for 30 years, which we still don't quite know uh, what to make of. Um, you know, at least, uh, I don't know about you, but at least in, in, in my own career, um, there are two papers that I read um, that gave me a sort of sick feeling in my stomach when I read them. And the sick feeling, you know, I sort of ignored for a while and it sort of you know, but the, the, all, these papers kept coming back, and I, and I had to keep dealing with them again and again and again over a period of many years. The first one was when I read Steve Weinberg's paper on the cosmological constant and the anthropic prediction of the cosmological constant as a graduate student. That hit me like a yeah. You read this when you were yes, I read it as, as a graduate. Well, <laughs> it did upset me tremendously. 
No, I mean, I, I, I walked around for a month sort of wondering if I should quit physics if something like this is true. Um, and, uh, um, but, uh, so anyway, I had a very complicated emotional relationship with that paper. Uh, but the second one was Ricardo's uh, and Alessandro's paper on the Lep paradox. Um, and these papers, of course, you know, one is a big, humongous problem. The other one's a niggly problem. But it's precisely the presence of both things, humongous and niggly problems, all pointing in the same direction that give you this sick feeling in your stomach that there may be something wrong. And one or the other would not have remotely been enough uh, for me to start taking these uh, uh, a natural idea seriously, as we did with, uh, with Savas. Um, but both of them played uh, a, a critical role in, uh, in, in, taking, in, in thinking about these things and, uh, and taking them seriously. So, so we still don't know, we still don't know which way this, this problem is going to break. Um, we're awaiting a spectacular presentation shortly by uh, Ricardo and uh, Gian and Alessandro about this uh, subject. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll have some uh, clarity about it after that. Uh, uh, I, I finally want to say two more things. Uh, reading Ricardo's papers um, uh, is always an incredible pleasure. There's a completely unmistakable style. Uh, and uh, when you read these papers, uh, uh, you know, the, another, uh, another thing which is like this is when I read uh, certain kinds of novelists. You know, when you pick up a novel by Ishiguro or Ian McEwan, um, you don't know what it's going to be about, but you know you're in safe hands. You know, you know that it's, uh, it's going to be masterful. You know that it's going to be, everything is going to be done as perfectly and beautifully as possible within its, uh, within its own structure. And so uh, you don't have to worry that you're going to be screwed around with. Okay? So you know what's, what's, what's coming. You know you're going to get something uh, uh, very worthwhile uh, out of the effort. And uh, this is not just a style of, of his papers, but uh, something that's been transmitted uh, to many generations of, of his students. I, I find this actually remarkable, that the, it's hard to imagine a collection of students with a more diverse set of personalities. Uh, um, and they're, they're all wonderful, and I, and I love all of them. Um, but uh, something is in common to, 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 to this uh, uh, fantastic uh, progeny of uh, Ricardo's, the same a scientific uh, integrity, uh, the same um, focus on important problems. And, uh, and I think uh, 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 maybe a, a, a final tribute to this wonderful collection of people that, that you've trained, I was just thinking about it in coming here, that your students have gone from being my own mentors when I was a grad student and postdoc myself, uh, to being people who I now uh, hire as postdocs. <laughs> So, so the fact that, uh, that, 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 that you've been uh, producing such an incredible group of people over such a long time is, uh, has, has, has met, met the world to me personally. All right, so um, uh, of course another great trait of, uh, another trait of great physicists like Ricardo uh, is that they're always thinking about the future. And so that's what I want to do in the sub substantive part of my talk, um, is talk about the future. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> we're here to uh, celebrate uh, Ricardo's 69th slash 70th birthday, um, but uh, I'd like to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about some hopes uh, for what we might be here to celebrate on his 80th birthday, and at least uh, what um, uh, some of the directions that, uh, that I'm going to be exploring over the next five to 10 years that hopefully will bear some fruit and, we can, uh, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll enjoy talking about when, when, when we gather again. Um, and <clears throat> uh, so there, there are two topics uh, I want to talk about, uh, and don't don't freak out too much about the 49 slides, okay? That, that's going to go. Oh, you, you can't see that. See, 49. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> try and stop me, Alessandra. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, you, sorry, uh, Andrea. Um, so. Um, so there are two topics I want to talk about. The, the uh, title I gave is From IR to UV, which is uh, maybe a bit of an inversion of the usual uh, top-down perspective. Uh, but there are two big topics um, uh, that, that, uh, that are involved here. Um, one of them uh, has to do with uh, uh, some very important conceptual questions that we have to deal with in the, uh, in the, in the 20th century, 21st century, one way or the other. Um, uh, that, that has to do with the ideas of emergent space-time and quantum mechanics. Um, 
And the other one, perhaps of uh, broader interest uh, to the audience here, uh, which is important to be thinking about on the five to 10 year time scale now, is what the 50 year future of, uh, especially the experimental part of high energy physics is going to be about. So these are the uh, two topics I want to discuss. So let me start with the first topic. Um, <clears throat> we've suspected, and we've known uh, for a long time that, uh, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that the picture of a, of the inside of a space-time uh, has got to be approximate. We know this from many, many thought experiments. You can't probe arbitrarily tiny distances. Uh, you need arbitrarily high energies that make black holes, and you can't see what's going on at distances that are small compared to the Planck length. Um, even more uh, strikingly, uh, there's just no local observables. If you try to make a measurement in a fixed size room, uh, uh, you need a larger and larger apparatus uh, in order to make a perfectly sharp quantum mechanical a measurement, but you can't make the apparatus arbitrarily large without collapsing the entire room into a black hole. So there's no local observables, um, and since there's no local observables, it stands to reason that there shouldn't be an inside of a spacetime in any description of uh, physics. And actually, uh, so that's, that's I think, non-controversial. Non uh, slightly more controversially, perhaps, uh, I think it's plausible that even quantum mechanics has got to be thought of as emergent from more primitive building blocks. Uh, and that ultimately has to do with questions of cosmology. So, uh, you know, in uh, today, the, the, the very, very deepest conceptual questions in physics don't have to do with gravity at very short distances. Uh, that's the 1980s view of the difficulties of putting quantum mechanics and gravity together. The real difficulty is cosmological and has to do with the fact, uh, for example, in our accelerating universe, um, we have access to a finite amount of stuff uh, inside our cosmological horizon. And that means that, uh, uh, that uh, all of the necessary things that quantum mechanics tells us in order to talk about things precisely. Quantum mechanics forces us to divide the world into two pieces, an infinite piece that does the measuring and a finite piece that's being looked at. And that division of the world into two pieces is simply impossible in the accelerating universe. We have a finite amount of stuff and so we can't make, the decision, uh, we, we can't make that uh, division. And so in order to make sense of these questions, not only do we have to figure out what emergent space time means, uh, with an emphasis on understanding uh, where time comes from, because the questions are intrinsically cosmological. But it's also conceivable that we're going to need an extension of quantum mechanics, because quantum mechanics simply is impotent in this situation. It doesn't tell us what to do. It doesn't even give us, in principle, uh, a precise uh, set of uh, observations uh, we can make, never mind a theory to, to predict those precise observations. So not for stupid reasons, but for these very subtle cosmological reasons, it's even conceivable you need an extension of quantum mechanics. So how do you go about uh, how do you go about working on this problem? It's uh, if if you if, if you go to any uh, summary talk and any conference on this kind of subject, everyone will tell you, uh, yes, space time is doomed. We have to figure out how to. Uh, get rid of it and so on, but it's not a research program. Um, how do you get up in the morning and, uh, and, and, and do something? You, know, you can't sit down on your desk and say, uh, okay, uh, space time is doomed. Uh, you have to do something. You have to have something to actually work on, okay? Um, and well, the most obvious thing to do is to try to attack some, try to attack the uh, quantum gravitational questions where these issues hit you um, at order one. But there's another strategy uh, which, um, uh, is what I've been pursuing over the past five or six years. It's not guaranteed that it's uh, it's not guaranteed that it's uh, that it's going to work, um, but it's uh, but it does give you something to do when you wake up in the morning, um, and um, it's also uh, data dominated in a way that's uh, rather different than data from the real world around us. Uh, but it's uh, it is in a sense data from the world around us uh, that's that's sitting there in the structure of the theories that we know for a fact describe nature. And um, the inspiration that I want to take from some of the history of physics here is that sometimes the most crucial clues are actually hiding in plain sight. They're not there as a feature of, uh, of, our, of what we're learning from the frontiers of experiment. Uh, they're actually hiding in plain sight as funny features of the existing theoretical framework. So <clears throat> famously, of course, here, uh, um, we knew about relativity long before Einstein. Um, but uh, what we didn't know is how to make uh, uh, Galilean invariance compatible with locality. And Einstein figured out that to make Galilean invariance compatible with locality, you have to deform Galilean invariance a little bit to a Lorentz invariance. But the clues were sitting there. There was no you know, latest, greatest experimental result that, uh, that, uh, that, that motivated this. It was just sitting there as a funny feature of the existing theoretical framework. Even more famously, the equality of gravitational inertial masses was something that was just sitting there uh, that, that led Einstein to GR. 
But actually, the real lesson that I want to draw is, uh, and even uh, is from the transition uh, in the transition from classical to quantum, which is even more radical in many, many ways than uh, relativity, much more radical. <clears throat> and here, of course, what we had to lose was determinism. We had to lose the classical picture of uh, determinism. And you might imagine that uh, uh, you're, a, you're a classical physicist in the year 1770, and you're visited in the middle of the night um, by uh, uh, what I like to call the ghost of theoretical physicist's future, um, uh, particularly apt around Christmas time. And they say, I have a message for you from 1930. Determinism is gone. And they vanish into the night, as ghosts of theorists' future I want to do. Okay? So what do you do with this information? Um, you're obviously very disturbed. Uh, you have to do something about it. After all, you might go tell someone else, and they'll write the paper first. Uh, so you want, to, you want to do something with this information. Well, what could you do? You could do something idiotic, like take Newton's laws and add stochastic terms to them to make it non-deterministic. You're trying to guess the right answer. And, and that's, it feels arbitrary. It's wrong. It's also the wrong answer we know. right? Then, so if you don't do that, it just seems hopeless. How are you going to sit there and guess about Hilbert spaces and weight functions and all the rest of it? It's way too big a leap, right? Is there something you could do that's a little closer to home? Well, there is. You could say that since you've been told that determinism is gone, it isn't really there fundamentally. And therefore, the determinism that you seem to see in F equals MA uh, uh, can't be fundamental. There should be some other way of talking about classical physics that's not manifestly deterministic but which has determinism as an outcome, somehow. Um, after all, it isn't really there. So there must be some way of talking about even the physics under your feet in a way that doesn't make use, heavy use of this concept that you know has got to be gone eventually in the next step. Is there such a way of talking about classical physics? There is. It's a principle of least action. And when we first learn the principle of least action, we're all startled by it. It seems very strange that the particle is sniffing out every path it can take from A to B and choosing the one that minimizes the action. It doesn't seem deterministic. Of course, it ends up being deterministic as a consequence of the kinds of paths we allow and the sorts of variations we do. Um, but it's another way, it's a reformulation of classical physics that does not rely on the concept that must eventually disappear. In a sense, once you discover the principle of least action, you're sort of 90% of the way there to quantum mechanics. You, you, you've pulled off a big trick. You've, you've figured out how to talk about something that is exactly deterministic in a way that determinism isn't playing a fundamental role. Okay? And once you have that, then, then you can imagine, as an even more imaginative step, deforming it uh, to finally lose determinism and go to quantum mechanics, invent the apathenogram. All right, so that was the situation in the classical to quantum transition. Today, we have to lose space time. Perhaps we have to deform quantum mechanics somehow. So we can follow an analogous strategy. And um, so this is, this is the strategy that I've been, uh, as I said, pursuing for around six years. There's two parts to the strategy. Step one is to reformulate quantum field theory. Okay? Um, eviscerating locality and unitarity, space time and quantum mechanics, eviscerating locality and unitarity from their central role uh, in our understanding of physics. And so that's step one. And after you've completed step one, step two would be to find some natural deformation of the structure, the analog of going from the principle of least action to the path integral. <clears throat> OK, well, of course, I've been spending most of my time on uh, step, step zero of step one. Okay? Uh, and actually, around five, six years ago, um, uh, I set off on this, uh, on this uh, uh, on this journey uh, to try to find a new picture for, uh, for uh, one of the simplest observables in a quantum field theory, the scattering amplitudes, uh, where there's no space time, no Hilbert space, no Lagrangian, no Hamiltonian, no path integrals, no gauge redundancies. Okay? Um, now, there are these highfalutin reasons that I just told you why, why we might seek such a reformulation of, uh, of a field theory. Uh, there are much more down-to-earth, low-brow reasons for it. Namely, when people computed scattering amplitudes for a living, and they needed to do so for important reasons, connecting theory and experiment at backgrounds at Hadron Colliders, they discovered that the traditional way of doing these computations using Feynman diagrams are horrendously complicated horribly complicated, while the final answers ended up being incredibly simple. And we learn more and more and more structure in that simplicity. For example, you know, back in 2006, people discovered a hidden infinite dimensional symmetry in tree-level scattering amplitudes. The symmetry could have been discovered in 1955. It wasn't discovered until 2006, because people didn't know the right place to look. Okay, there, are th there's this, there are these incredible gems lying under our feet for decades in the structure of physics that we know for a fact describes nature. You know, good old-fashioned gauge theories which is tremendously hidden in the usual picture 
Uh, why? Because the usual picture makes locality and unitarity completely manifest at tremendous cost, at the cost of introducing this humongous amount of gauge redundancy, which isn't a feature of the physics, and in fact obscures features of the final answer. So it's these two things, the fact that, the, that the, uh, the intermediate steps are so complicated while the results are simple, together with these uh, underlying philosophical reasons that we should seek a way of reformulating field theory where you gut the space-time and Hilbert space structure from it, uh, which, is, uh, which, which, led to this, uh, which led to this program. <clears throat> and it took around six years, but... Um, uh, but in the, last, uh, in the last year or so, uh, I think we found one example of how this can work. And there's probably many, many more iterations, even in these very simple toy theories where we've managed to do this. Um, but uh, but it's, at least, uh, it's at least one existence proof that this, that this, this program is possible to uh, realize. Um, and it's been done in the simplest and toyest, and you can put as many diminutives as you want in front of this theory of all, uh, maximally supersymmetric gauge theories in four dimensions in the planar limit, planar n equals four super Yang mills. But in planar n equals four super Yang mills, we now have a very different picture for what scattering amplitudes are. In other words, we have a new question to which the scattering amplitudes are the answer. Um, not unitary evolution through space-time of uh, gluons coming in and going out, but something completely different. Uh, and uh, if you give the external kinematical data for the gluons, which turn out to be encoded in some nice four-dimensional vectors z, then the amplitude for n particles, k is the number of negative helicity gluons, it doesn't really matter, uh, at L loops is, in a specific sense, the volume of a certain geometric object that lives in the space of k-planes in k plus four dimensions. Um, uh, this this mathematical object, um, pre predecessors to this, uh, uh, to this object that showed up in these studies uh, had been quite surprisingly studied by mathematicians in the last five, six years or so, um, uh, associated with the, the word, uh, the positive Grassmannian, which I'll explain shortly. Uh, but the thing that actually gives you the full amplitude itself has so far not been studied by mathematicians, so we have to give it a new name, uh, and this object we call the amplitohedron. So you should think that, in, that there's a space, uh, once you give the external data, in the space there is something like a polyhedron. Okay? Uh, that's why it's called amplitudehedron. Amplitude for amplitudehedron to make you think of some kind of polyhedron. You draw this shape in this uh, abstract space. You compute the volume of the shape. The volume is the scattering amplitude. Now, I'm not going to be able to explain what this is in any detail and get to the second part of my talk, so this will have to be very impressionistic, but, uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's impressionistic, but, but it's actually completely precise. Um, so the object is extremely simple to define. It's being completely defined in the next uh, two slides. Uh, trying to understand how it works takes, takes a lot longer. But um, all we're doing in this story, the, the geometric object is just a generalization of a triangle. Uh, in fact, there's two generalizations of a triangle. If I hand you a triangle in a plane, there it is. I give you its vertices z1, z2, z3. Uh, it's convenient to work projectively. Uh, so you imagine these are three-dimensional vectors up to a rescaling. Then if I want to think about all the points on the inside of the triangle, then it's just a weighted sum. It's a weighted sum of z1, z2, and z3 with positive coefficients. Think of that as just the center of mass with masses c1, c2, and c3. Okay, so that's the inside of a triangle. Uh, which you can associate with this triplet of numbers, C1, C2, C3, mod GL1, uh, with all these Cs positive. Now, th this inside of a triangle could be generalized. Instead of imagining that you have uh, 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 this, this triplet of numbers up to overall rescaling that just defines a line in three dimensions, you can imagine uh, having a general k-plane in n dimensions, uh, which is specified by giving n k-dimensional vectors modulo a GLK, uh, so the space of n k-dimensional vectors modulo GLK is the same as the space of k-planes in n dimensions. That's known as the Grassmannian. And the analog of making all these guys positive is to take any k of these guys that are ordered in increasing order and demand that the determinant of that k by k sublock is positive. That minor of this k by n matrix is positive. So we say that all the ordered minors are positive. Okay? That generalization of the inside of the triangle is known as the positive Grassmannian. And that already uh, has, has a very direct relationship with the scattering amplitudes in a way that isn't obvious. Uh, but there's one more generalization of the triangle that you can consider. You can go from a triangle to, a, to the inside of a convex polygon. 
And here the idea is exactly the same. Now I have to give you a, a bunch of z's, not just three of them. All the points in there are a positive linear combination of these points. But in order for it to be a, a convex polygon, it turns out that these external data also have to have the same kind of positivity condition. So the inside of a polygon is a positive sum of positive external data. And if you do the same generalization to the inside of a polygon as we did to the inside of a triangle to take it to the Grassmannian, uh, we have a space that's defined by all, by all positive linear combinations of positive external data uh, that lives in the space of k planes in k plus 4 dimensions. So y lives in the space of k planes in k plus 4 dimensions, but it's a particular part of that space that's given by, uh, by, uh, by this formula, scanning over all c's. So this is a generalization of the inside of a polygon. It's a kind of a curvy space. It's not even in general a polytope. It's a curvy space. And you can, just like you can take the inside of a polygon and break it up into a sum of triangles, you can take the space and break it up naturally into the sum of a bunch of regions. Um, but the space itself is just sitting there uh, uh, nice and given. Uh, uh, when you understand what to mean by the volume of the space, the volume of the space are all the tree amplitudes in this theory. There's no Lagrangian, no path integral, no nothing. You just have this simple generalization of the polygon. Its volume computes all tree amplitudes. <clears throat> what, are, what, are, what are loop corrections? In a very specific sense, uh, loops arise from hiding particles in this picture. So you take this, uh, you, you, you take this uh, nice big positive space, and you literally imagine hiding particles. Uh, and you try to hide particles in a natural way. You find the only way to hide particles is to hide them in pairs. And if you do that, that gives you an extended notion of positivity. Uh, now the space is a little bigger. We have k planes in k plus 4 dimensions together with uh, a bunch L, two planes in the complementary four-dimensional space uh, to the k plane. Uh, but it's exactly the same formula. It's precisely the same formula. And this defines the amplitohedron in general. So it depends on n, k, and loop order L. And if you compute the volume of that space, you're getting the scattering amplitude at L loop order. Now, uh, one way that we can check that this is right is that scattering amplitudes have certain uh, singularity structures in momentum space. Um, uh, if we, it, they, they, they develop poles in special places, and on those poles they have to factorize in specific ways uh, in a way that encodes locality and unitarity. Ordinarily, these singularity structures follow from Feynman diagrams, and they follow directly from the local space-time uh, quantum mechanical picture of what's going on. We don't have any of that here, but instead they follow in a quite remarkable way from, from this positive geometry, just from the geometric features of, this, uh, of the amplitohedron. Okay. <clears throat> now, if you go back and you, and you try to actually systematically build this big space out of gluing together little guys, uh, you're led to a natural question. I mean, uh, how, do you, how do you find, um, just mathematically, uh, how do you go about uh, making the building blocks? And the building blocks are going to have to be sort of big matrices that satisfy that all their minors are positive. Uh, that's just a very natural mathematical question. And our, mathemat and our mathematician friends uh, attacked this question. They said, how do you make these big positive matrices? And the answer they found is that you can only make them by building them up gradually, by amalgamating simple pieces together. So you take little tiny G13s and G23s, and you glue them together. Uh, and as you glue them together, the things that are positive to begin with stay positive under this natural gluing process, right? So they, in their, in their attempt to uh, understand uh, these big matrices, started drawing pictures that look like this. And in fact, we, we, had, a, we had a wonderful day, I remember, at, uh, at the MIT, where we spent an entire morning talking to, to one of our mathematician friends. And, and after lunch, he said, you know, it's very surprising. There's something very important to me in my understanding of these things that hasn't shown up yet. There are these, there are these graphs that I like to draw. I said, oh, really, what do they look like? And this is the one he drew. And these are literally the pictures that we had been drawing as scattering amplitudes mavens for the past four or five years, uh, which represent something completely different. Uh, they represent an on-shell process in space-time. Uh, these are the elementary three-particle amplitudes of the theory for plus, plus, minus, and minus, minus, plus helicity gluon amplitudes. They're glued together in a way where everything is on shell in here. And in fact, there's this one-to-one -one correspondence between these building blocks that we ultimately build into the amplitohedron and actual on-shell scattering processes. So the big picture is that there is this sort of God-given 
simple mathematical object. Its volume is the scattering amplitude. If you want to actually compute it, it's natural to break it up into pieces. You can break it up this way, you can break it up that way. And each one of these pieces has an interpretation in terms of some particular on-shell scattering process. The pieces individually don't have a local or unitary interpretation, but the final result is local and unitary, and locality and unitary emerge without being put in as derived facts. Uh, just, uh, just, just so you have uh, a picture, um, the amplitohedron in general lives in a, in a very high dimensional space, but just so you see that it's something concrete, here's a particular three-dimensional face of, of, of the amplitohedron that actually, uh, in this case, literally computes the scattering amplitude for that particular helicity configuration of gluons. Okay? So if you have one minus, seven minus, eight minus, the rest of them plus, you give me the external data. From that data, I draw this picture. I compute the volume of that guy. That's the scattering amplitude. Okay? And that's hundreds of pages of Feynman diagrams. And of course, this stuff actually works. So. Um, uh, so, as of a number of years ago, uh, not using Feynman diagrams, certainly not, but using the sort of most cutting edge methods for computing, uh, for, for computing amplitudes, uh, people had determined, um, for example, these are the uh, two loop, uh, uh, the, the leading non trivial two loop amplitudes in, in the planar maximally supersymmetric theory. And there are sort of pictures that look like this. And it goes on for 10 pages of things like that. That's just for the simplest so-called MHV amplitudes. Uh, but, but ideas related to the ones that I'm telling you about collapse the entire previous 10 pages into the top line. See, there's a single object. Okay? And, that, and this picture, we now understand. So we've had this formula for a while. But we now understand the pictures of, like this are supposed to be thought of as building blocks, building up the amplitohedron, you know, fitting together in a way that ultimately fills out beautifully the entire amplitohedron in this case. Um, <clears throat> uh, the next most complicated amplitudes had never been computed. Here they are, all of them. They fit on the line. The three loop guys had never been computed. Here they all are. They fit on the line. Uh, and how do we know we're right when they haven't been computed before? Uh, and you know, this is uh, uh, one of the things I mentioned before. This is a very data-driven business. Uh, the data is all the scattering amplitudes that have ever been computed before, so you have to match them. Uh, but also, because we're not using locality and unitarity as an input uh, in, in these computations, it's a check on the answer, a check that they're local and unitary. And it's a very powerful check. If you mess up any one of these things, there's, there's a greater than or equal to sign there. If you remove the equal to sign, it's wrong. It's all wrong. Okay? Uh, only the, exactly the correct answer can work. So they're very powerful checks on what you're doing the whole time. Now that's for the planar maximally supersymmetric theory. <clears throat> uh, we have indications that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that at least much of the structure uh, um, sh should go through beyond the planar limit. For example, we have this picture of on shell scattering processes that can be glued together to build the entire amplitude. And these things are associated with, with a certain form on the Grassmannian. Uh, this form has two pieces. So you draw one of these pictures. You associate variables with the edges of these diagrams. But roughly speaking, there's two pieces. There's one piece that, 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 that sits there already, even for n equals 4. And there's another piece that, that shows up when you, when you have less than four supersymmetries. And it turns out that this piece, which is sitting there for everybody, has to do with the universal infrared singularities of the theory. And this piece, which is new when you don't have n equals 4, is where all the ultraviolet singularities come from. And they're, in fact, disjoint from each other. They live in completely disjoint different parts of the Grassmannian. So, uh, so somehow, uh, once we go to less supersymmetry, we have to start seeing the physics of the, of the renormalization group. We have to somehow make, picture, uh, make contact with this beautiful picture of Wilson and Polchinski for understanding the structure of the renormalization group, which is quite strikingly similar to the, uh, to the, uh, to the structure that also encodes locality and unitarity for, for scattering amplitudes. So that's one aspect of the from IR to UV story. Uh, we understand now, in a sense, everything about the infrared structure of these planar theories. The really new frontier is to figure out how that marries with the ultraviolet. Um, but we have many indications sitting there in the geometry that, uh, that, uh, that, that the pieces are, are waiting there, ready, um, are, are sitting there waiting to be made some sense of. And that's something that we're working on right now. And um, finally, along these lines, uh, this is a, for the sort of 10 year time scale. Um, so far, we don't have gravity in this picture. Of course, the underlying motivations for searching for such a reformulation of quantum field theory were gravitational. 
And so um, uh, you can ask, you know, well, what, what could the fantasy be? You know, what, what, uh, so uh, the, the, the fantasy, if any of this is on the right track, is that there is some way of thinking about you know, all of physics without the inside of a space time in it. Um, and that, uh, that way, whatever that is, uh, uh, when you have planar n equals 4 super A mills, reduces to the kinds of structures that we're seeing now. Okay? Um, so obviously, we're going to have to go, that there, we have to see many, many more things. Um, uh, but, but we have an existence proof that it's possible. It's possible to talk about local and unitary physics without a space time, without a Hilbert space, without path integrals, without all the rest of it. So what is it that we could be looking for? Well, we could be looking, uh, I think, uh, for, for, for a theory uh, which is, in a sense, ultimately gives us uh, boundary observables, like the S matrix, uh, which is the only thing we can talk about when we have gravity, at least when we have asymptotically flat space. Um, but we've, we've grown accustomed to the idea, especially in the anti de Sitter space, that, uh, that, uh, that if we're going to talk about boundary ob observables, they're going to be extremely strongly coupled and there'll be no good way of uh, talking about it. Somehow the only weakly coupled description will have to go back into the bulk. It's very unsatisfying. Um, I think there might be another picture. Uh, you see, that's, that's, uh, that, that looks very complicated because it's the usual Lagrangian-based form formulation of the field theory. That Lagrangian-based formulation might look very complicated. But I think there's, there's likely another picture which is loosely something like a volume again. And loosely computing the volume will be done by triangulations. Um, but that the triangulations uh, correspond to covering the inside of the spacetime with a sort of nested set of overlapping causal diamonds and giving a systematic way of building up the interior. One feature that this, shares, this fantasy shares in common with the precise thing that we've managed to see in the planar theory is that the individual building blocks don't have a precise spacetime or quantum mechanical interpretation as we know it's impossible to have on the interior. Whereas at least it's possible for the final object that's being built up to have a precise quantum mechanical interpretation, as we saw, is also possible, and it indeed does in the planar n equals 4 example. All right. So that was topic one, and I'm basically out of time. Um, but let me uh, say a little bit about uh, topic two. So uh, topic two is the other aspect of from IR to UV, um, which is uh, the experimental aspect. We're stuck in the IR. We need to go to the UV. Um, and I just want to spend a few minutes uh, talking about motivations for great big circular colliders somewhere in the world. Um, we're talking about uh, a 100 kilometer um, uh, circumference uh, uh, ring uh, that can operate uh, an E plus E minus machine at uh, at least 250 GV energy and operate as a Higgs factory and also give us proton proton collisions at, at, uh, at 100 TeV. Um, and there are many, there are many uh, uh, motivations for this. The most obvious one I'll come back to at the end is that it's the frontier. We can do it as human beings um, without enslaving half of humanity, right? We have the, we have the, uh, we have, um, uh, the, the budget and the economy at our disposal to do that. We were thinking about building essentially this machine. It was the SSC. We're thinking of doing it 20 years ago. So obviously it's not impossible. We can do it. And so we can do it. We must do it. Um, uh, but let me just say a few words about, uh, uh, about some of the physics motivations. Um, since we're going to talk about naturalness a lot, uh, um, uh, shortly, uh, let me uh, go over this quickly. Um, uh, the first reason has to do with the ultimate fate of naturalness. Um, uh, we're at a crucial fork in the road uh, with, uh, with what we're learning from the LHC. We'll either discover some kind of natural theory at the 11th hour, which is going to involve some big new principles, or we might get more and more convinced that, uh, that, that naturalness was wrong, and that's, in a sense, an even bigger paradigm shift. Maybe the weak scale starts looking more and more like the cosmological constant, and the big question becomes, how tuned is it? And the problem is, if we see the Higgs and nothing else at the LHC, we'll have evidence for a fine tuning of maybe about a percent, maybe not even quite as bad as a percent for the weak scale. And it's not so obvious that that's convincing. And that's because we've seen many percent level accidents elsewhere in nature. Um, so two neutrons aren't bound by 60 keV. That looks like about a percent accident. They, they could have been bound, but that 60 keV scale is, is, is a lot smaller than, uh, than the rest of the scales in nuclear physics. But no one has gone around for 50 years saying that that fact is an indication that there's a multiverse. Maybe, maybe Lawrence was just telling us something like that, okay? But, but, uh, but, but most of us haven't been taking this as a, as a humongous, uh, as, a, as a big surprise. Uh, there's a low quadrupole of the CMB. 
That's an accident as far as we can tell. There are stupid things like the moon eclipsing the sun. That's a percent accident. And I, I doubt any of us are going to come up with an anthropic explanation for that. Although Josh Ruderman was trying one out on me a little while ago. Uh, but that's just sick. Okay? So uh, this is, a, if anything, this is an anthropic but a mis-virginothropic principle. All I can think that this did is kill a lot of Mayan virgins um, when, 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 there were, when there were eclipses. Uh, it wasn't any good for life. It was just good for death. Okay? Um, so, if we add electroweak symmetry breaking to this list, it would be fascinating, but I don't think it would be a knockout. We'd say, oh, there are lots of things, maybe we just got a little unlucky. How will we know? Well, obviously, we go to higher energies. We either find something, and it's the end of the discussion, or we find nothing, and the tuning increases quadratically with the center of mass energy in the machine, which beats anything you can do uh, with, uh, uh, with indirect um, uh, means. And so, if we go to 100 TeV, uh, and still see nothing, then we'll have evidence for tuning, not at the percent level, but at a one part in 10,000 level. And you could continue to shrug your shoulders all you want. Okay? You can say, one in a million, I don't care. One in a billion, I don't care. Okay? It's not about our feelings, uh, but there is an invariant fact that this would be 100 times worse than any tuning we've seen anywhere else in physics. And I think that is significant, other than perhaps the cosmological constant. Okay? That is significant. Because the CC has been sitting there the whole time. We don't know what, what, what it's telling us. The Higgs could have been totally natural. Maybe it's not going to be totally natural. If we don't see, if we see the Higgs and nothing else at the LHC, it'll be in the muck and the mire of all the other crap that seems tuned at that kind of level. But if we really see tuning at the part in 10,000 level, I think it pulls clear away from all the rest of the junk and really starts in a much more convincing way uh, heading, towards, um, uh, heading towards the CC. Um, OK, uh, I'm, I'm out of time, so I won't have time to, uh, to uh, describe how, um, how uh, the, the Higgs factory mode here uh, can, can play a very important role. Actually, um, having 10 of the 12 Zs, uh, which you could do at a circular machine, uh, could also be a fascinating probe going, doing precision electroweak physics with a factor of a million more Zs than we had at LEP and SLC. Could be an absolutely fascinating probe of very, very high energy scales. Um, and, well, okay, I don't have time uh, to, to, to explain uh, some of these things, but, but even in perverse theories that, that, I, that I would be very depressed if they were true, uh, where you have uncolored particles canceling uh, the quadratic divergences, uh, um, uh, uh, canceling the, the, the top quadratic sensitivity, uh, you'll miss all the particles at the LHC, but you will not miss them at these machines. You will not miss them because they give you a percent level a uh, little smaller than percent level modifi modification to the Z Higgs couplings in a quite model independent way, um, and so what you could see at uh, which what you could see at, at the Z plus C minus machines, and you could eventually uh, look uh, for these new uncolored particles directly at a hundred TV machine uh, just through uh, uh, off shell vector boson fusion with, through an off shell Higgs decaying invisibly to these uh, to these uncolored top partners. Now, if instead we're just a percent unlucky, and the LHC could still miss everything, but the 100 TeV PP collider will catch the new physics. And here's a plot of the reach for uh, super partners in, in 100 TeV collisions. Uh, um, uh, even though I'm out of time, I just want you to spend you know, one minute staring at this plot and see how beautiful it is. For the first time, the axes are really measured in a TeV in these collisions. Okay? It's not even true at, at the LHC. Okay? But the physics reach of a 100 TeV collider could go to you know, 20 TeV for squarks and gluinos. So if we're just a little unlucky, we miss the super partners, uh, percentage tuned, we'll make them. For damn sure, we'll make them in 100 TeV collisions. OK, uh, there's good arguments for seeing split, um, uh, uh, for seeing the split, split Susie spectrum. Finally, what if the LHC discovers a relatively natural spectrum? See, I'm just saying no matter what we learn from the LHC, we're going to have to keep going to 100 TeV. What if the LHC discovers a relatively natural spectrum? Well, it's not 1995 anymore. Uh, we don't have this picture that we'll discover 300 GeV gluinos. We'll make a gluino a second at the LHC. Uh, so we'll already have a gluino factory. And then we'll do very precision measurements of uh, the electric weak spectrum at a low energy plus or minus collider. Even if we discover new physics at the LHC, if we have two TeV gluinos, we're not going to make a million of them. We'll make 10,000 of them. Okay? That's enough to claim discovery, but it's not enough to do anything with. Okay? We're, we're, so even if there is new physics, and we see it at the LHC, we're going to have to keep going uh, in order to make more of them. Uh, what we already know makes it implausible that we'll see the whole spectrum of new physics, even if it's relatively natural. So for instance, if we have uh, 
uh, the, the split family um, scenario, the stops at 600, and the first two generations at 345 TV, we'll, we'll see these guys at the LHC, but we won't see those. So we'll want to know that they're there. We want to know what's going on with them. Is it indeed U2 cubed with this very special set of flavons that, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that, that is still consistent with all the B-factory data, for example? Um, we, we'll, 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 we'll want to know something like that. Uh, and we won't see them at the LHC, but it's a complete piece of cake in, in 100 TV collisions. And more generally, we'll want a factory for new colored particles uh, to study how they make the Higgs natural. Okay. All right. So uh, let me skip many of the other uh, uh, motivations. There are some, there are some uh, really interesting, just simple, very simple, but beautiful new physics points. Uh, for instance, uh, 100 TV collisions are the first time you really see SU2 cross U1 as an unbroken gauge symmetry. W's and Z's can be treated as massless. You start seeing the phenomenon of W and Z radiation. The electroweak Sudikov factors are not particularly small. It's easier to see neutrinos, to see dark matter because they radiate Z's. Uh, there's all kinds of very interesting, uh, it's not just scaling things up from the LHC. There's some new physics opportunities involved. All right, but the, the ultimate reason for this uh, for uh, doing this physics is, is what I said at the beginning. It's the absolute obvious future uh, of the field. Um, and big machines and big physics ideas are the lifeblood of our subject. You know, we, we, have, um, we have taken for granted for, for centuries that, that fundamental physics is going to attract at least a fraction of the, of the, of the, of the brightest minds on the planet to devote 20, 30, 40 years of their life to working on very difficult problems with not always a, 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 an obvious reward in sight. Why do we do this? We, we do it because there's grand things at stake. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and for, our, for our science to continue to be connected ultimately to experiment, we need that, that, that grand vision to be connected to something on the ground. We really need something like this uh, to happen. And fortunately, you know, unfortunately, for, for me and my country, the US is sadly a non-player for now. But uh, Europe is showing some vision for doing this, fortunately. So CERN is exploring in the context of the TLEP and the VLHC with, these, uh, with the uh, uh, future circular collider studies ongoing. And China is starting to get uh, seriously interested in exploring this. Uh, in China, these machines are called the Circular Electron-Positron Collider or the Super Proton-Proton Collider. Um, and um, I've been involved with, uh, uh, with initiating a new center in Beijing for studying uh, these machines, studying the physics case, uh, uh, trying to make the physics case uh, uh, for these machines. It's called the Center for Future High Energy Physics. Uh, it's affiliated with the Institute for High Energy Physics of the Chinese, uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Um, and uh, our activities are going to uh, uh, kick off uh, this coming uh, February with, with a kickoff meeting from the 23rd to the 25th. Um, just so you see that they're, they're serious, that's, that's a picture uh, taken from a talk earlier this week for two proposed sites in China where they might actually build uh, these, uh, these uh, colliders. They're, they're, I think, around 200 kilometers northeast of Beijing by the coast. Uh, that's a 50 kilometer and 70 kilometer uh, version. Uh, the 100 kilometer version is not yet shown. They're not quite yet talking about it, but, uh, uh, but well, we'll see how that, uh, we'll see how that proceeds. Uh, and uh, also from the same talk, um, here it is. These efforts, CEPC and SPPC, are clearly, uh, are clearly indicated in the, uh, in the possible future of colliders in China, and, uh, and um, at least in this uh, ambitious uh, startup plan, uh, this physics, at least, is going to start being talked about before, uh, before 2020. So um, I think I'll, I'll end with that. And uh, in the famous words of JFK, if you're interested in this kind of physics, ask not what big circular colliders can do for you. Ask what you can do for big circular colliders. And if you're interested in exploring these things in Beijing, please get in touch with me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? So, so uh, if we believe in modification of space-time and so on, we can start approaching this modification theoretically just by writing down some stupid high curvature correction terms in your Lagrangian. How about quantum mechanics? Can, how, you know, the, pro the trouble with quantum mechanics is it's even hard to start approaching it incrementally if it's modified? That's right. Well, so, uh, so the answer is I don't know, but, but I would ask you, 
uh, I would ask you the same question if you're a classical mechanic in 1770. How do you approach modifying determinism a little bit? The only thing you could imagine doing is adding stupid stochastic terms to Newton's laws. You're not going to do it. You're not going to sit there. I mean, you, you think about it. The, 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 right. That's true. So that's right. So, so, so that's, that's, that's good. That's really good because it means that things are a lot more constrained. So there's fewer ways that, that, that we can go wrong. That, that to me suggests that if we find the correct framework in which to, you see, the reason we find it so hard to do is because we, 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 we stick inside this Hilbert space framework, right? Um, and even before any of these fancy things, there's something a little funny. You, you say there's this nice Hilbert space. Great. You, you say there's a Hilbert space there. Immediately, you're in some tension with Lorentz invariance. Immediately, uh, you know, in order to keep things Lorentz invariant, we have to go slightly outside a normal Hilbert space and talk about negative norms, you know, to add a little bit of ex extra juice uh, on top of the uh, usual structure. So what, we've, what we see in this example, maybe the example is irrelevant. Maybe it's a total red herring. I doubt it. I personally doubt it. Okay? But, uh, uh, but, but uh, at least what it gives us is an existence proof of how it's possible to talk about exactly the same physics where there is no Hilbert space, there is no space time, there's none of the usual structure. Now, here, I have no idea how to deform the structure yet. Um, and and I, I think it's exactly the wrong time to ask how to deform it because we're probably nowhere near finding uh, the correct set of words that work in general. We've probably found some aspect, if the whole thing makes any, if the whole thing is going anywhere, um, then probably what we found is, is an aspect of the correct way of thinking about things reflected in this very, very special case. And we probably have to further dislodge it from the special case to see what, what the real structure is. But, um, but I suspect that these kind of ideas, the things that, that even the, the kinds of mathematics which is involved, something I should have said, something which is guaranteed ahead of time if you're trying to, to do this, is you must find new mathematical structures. There's no way you're going to reproduce, as you know very well, all the tremendous richness of uh, quantum field theory just from some stupid thing, right? If you're removing Lagrangians and, and, uh, and, and path integrals and all the rest of it, some, some other remarkable structure has to come in and replace it. Well, in this example, we see an extremely simple structure. You know, convex geometry in the Grassmannian uh, can sit underneath the whole thing. Uh, I suspect that kind of thing is, if it's going anywhere, I suspect that kind of thing is going to, uh, uh, going to be the kind of things that we're going to see more of. Uh, yeah, yeah, very short. Uh, yeah, try to be, yeah, very short. Yeah, because, um, yeah, I had a similar question, um, and, and then I just wanted to know your opinion. I, obviously, you, as you say, it's a bit too premature. But, uh, but because you mentioned quantum mechanics and cosmology, which I very much care, and then I have my own view too. And is not the biggest thing to eliminate is, oh, by the way, it's a, it's a progress is very impressive, and it's already kind of enough, but to not just the space time, but the basis. Because you, 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 by talking about uh, like a two gluon, a three gluon, whatever the basis, because the observation is of course correlation in a finite dimensional system. By going to S matrix or in out, in out formalism, <laughs> it's a big thing. It's already you're committing into infinite dimensional correlation to infinite yeah, dimensional so let, let, let me let me say something. That, let me say something about this. So 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 two things I would say is one is I think uh, this is all pure speculation, but I'll say something slightly concrete. Uh, so first, people have said the words emergent space time for a long time. But I think it can't just be emergent space-time. It has to be that space-time and quantum mechanics emerge together. Or okay? basis. Uh, uh, not necessarily uh, have to be here about space, because this is a problem. Well, whatever it is, space, yeah. Right? So, 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 so first that. And, and also, in our little toy, very toy, very baby <sighs> example, exactly that happens. It's, there isn't no limit of this thing where it's just local and not unitary. Okay? The, the locality and unitarity are hand in hand. They just come out in one piece out of the, uh, out of the uh, geometry. So that's one thing. The other thing, a little more specifically, uh, related to cosmology and, uh, and uh, quantum mechanics, Basis is, is yeah. if, this, if this picture, if this picture, uh, if this wild picture I had, uh, I mean, a hope, uh, if anything like it pans out, the idea is that when you have some asymptotics, like asymptotic flat space, which allows you to define something like an S matrix, allows you to define well, something that's quantum mechanically a, well defined. Yeah. There's an infinite dimensional thing that you're building up, but you're building up, that's another aspect of IR to UV, okay? You're, 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 you're taking this thing at very, very long distances and you're filling it in to go to, in this triangulation, you're filling it in to go to, to, uh, to, uh, to a smaller and smaller scales. But 
what you're doing is taking these elementary building blocks that don't have a space-time or quantum mechanical interpretation and putting them together until finally you get an infinite object that does. It does have a quantum mechanical one. But I think Hulu what might happen is if you stop before you make it infinitely big, as must happen when we have cosmology, then it won't have a precise quantum mechanical interpretation. The hope is it'll have some interpretation, but we don't know what that interpretation with, is. I just say, without holography, we ourselves are offshore physics. So you're committing into... Without holography, of course. If you, have, if you map into boundary we're, theory, we're, then, we're, then it may work. We're approximate off-shell physics. That's right. And, and, and all I'm saying is that it's possible for the approximate, the approximate off-shell physics to emerge gradually in this picture, okay? By, by gradually, you know, tiling the... the well, anyway, well, we, can, we can discuss it more, more, more offline. Okay.